Hi everyone, and welcome to Dan's Destinations. In this episode, I took a trip to the old gold mining town of Walhalla. Walhalla is about two hours east of Melbourne, and along the way, we stopped by the town of Yalon in the Latrobe Valley before heading up to Walhalla. By the way, an interesting fact is that 98% of you who watch this video are not subscribed. So if you like my guides, please do subscribe and hit the notification bell as it really helps us out. The Yalon power stations are a series of coal-fired power stations that was built between 1920s to 1960s. Today, only the Yalon W plant remains and it is the second largest power station in Victoria, supplying 22% of Victoria's electricity. It can be viewed from various lookout points around it, but you can also get a majestic view just by driving past it. It is huge and the video does not convey the sense of scale of this facility. Aside from Yalon, the Latro Valley also hosts the Loyang power stations, which consists of two sites, A and B, located on the outskirts of Trerogon. Both Yalon and Loyang are the last two coal-fired power stations in Victoria. Loyang was constructed in stages throughout the 1980s and was owned by the State Electricity Commission of Victoria. It was privatised in 1995 and the ownership was eventually passed to AGL for Loyang A. The power stations are supplied by the coal mines next to it and you can see the huge scale of the mines. We were also surprised to see cattle roaming around the grounds near the coal mines. Next, we drove up to Walhalla. Walhalla is a gold mining town that was formed in the late 1862. At its peak, it had 4,000 residents, but in 2021, it has only 35 permanent residents. It functions mostly as a tourist attraction and is famed for its historical tours, walking trails and four-wheel drive ghost town tours. The settlement was originally named Stringer's Creek, after Edward Stringer, who was part of the group that discovered gold in the Thompson River Valley. The settlement was later renamed Walhalla, after the name of the town's largest mine. The name Walhalla refers to the Halls of Immortality in the afterlife of Norse mythology. In June 2021, the town was flooded by a massive storm that hit Victoria, and you can still see road barriers around the damaged sections of the road today. Before our visit, we first started off at the Long Tunnel Extended Gold Mine Tour, then Stringers Park for lunch, and then the Historical Cemetery, and finally the Heritage Railway. Tours are conducted every day with more slots on weekends, and you can check their website for the schedule. Tickets cost around $20 to $25. Before starting our tour, we had to select our hard hats before we met our experienced guide, Richard, and his trusty assistant, Bella, the collie. Uh, gold was discovered in Walhalla in 1862 by Ned Stringer and his companions. They found alluvial gold in the creek. Uh, alluvial gold is tiny, tiny, minute little specks of washed gold. But gold is gold when it's all melted down, it's all the same stuff. But they, uh, so they picked out their areas, registered the claims, they sparked a gold rush. People quickly flocked to the area, get as much gold as possible. That easy alluvial gold was all taken up within three or four months. Two miners on the field knew that this gold didn't just magically appear in the creek, that probably came from a quartz reef somewhere. So they searched the hills to find that quartz reef, and they found all along this western ridge here outcrops of quartz reef. So they didn't mind that reef on the surface, but they knew the best way to get to the heart of the reef 
the reef is running north-south as you turn east-west and strike that reef on the ground. They managed to raise 14,400 pounds of shareholders' money to start this mine in 1865. It was known as the Hercules United Mining Company in 1865. This was one of the later mines in Wahala. Many of the other mines had started their gold mine uh, probably three years before this mine, already found the reef and already on really, really good gold. So we're all ready to go in now, I think. Two, three, four, five, keep going, go in five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Well, <laughs> 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 Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're now 115 metres in from the entrance. It's taken us about, well, a bit longer this time, probably normally about two minutes to walk this distance, but it took the Hercules Mining Company two years to dig their way from that entrance portal to about here. Very, very slow going. This is what they're digging with, is known as the hammer and tap. So this tap here is just a hardened steel bar, and on the end of this, there's a little four-sided cross thing on the end there. Yeah. So that's just driven into the rock. So these miners are working here 24 hours a day, six days a week. Um, so one man's holding this steel bar like that, and the other man bashes this as hard as he can with his hammer. Like when, nails. So when he hits it, the other man will just give it a little turn, and he just bashes it and turns. At the end of the hole, that little four side across there is just crushing the rock in a slightly different spot every time it's struck by the hammer. It slowly, slowly works its way into the rock. Once it's in about the length of this bar, that's only one of the 20 holes they have to drill on the rock. Um, it takes six 24-hour days to drill the, uh, all these holes. When these holes are drilled, these, um, they fill up these holes with good old-fashioned black gunpowder. That's the only explosive they had in those days. It goes in with a wadding and a fuse. They light those fuses, exit the mine, come back in after the explosion and pick up all that rubble and the wheelbarrow take it out and start again. They're only digging the way into the mine about a metre per week. That's uh, and they're trying to dig as hard as they can because the payment was something like five, uh, sorry, seven dollars per metre of rock we moved. That seven dollars was divided between the mine manager and all the workers. The harder you work, the more rock you remove, the more money you get. Yeah, kids will remember that when they're older when they go to work, won't they? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, when they get to here, they realise that they haven't started their mine on the right angle. They're a little bit off their, right, off their right angle. They're not going directly at the reef. So they change direction here and go down that smaller tunnel there behind you. Um, that smaller tunnel used to be this size there, all the way out to the end. But where we're standing here, um, this part of the tunnel was not existing in that early part. So when the one you can see that small tunnel used to come out there, do a little bend here and go all the way out to the entrance. Where we're standing now has been modified a little bit later on. You can see jackhammer marks on the roof here. It's much higher, it's much, much wider. Uh, so that's what they did, is that's to bring machinery and stuff into the mine. So what we're going to do now, we're all going to go down this small tunnel here. I'll lead the way. Now there's only one, one, maybe two, or maybe three problems here. It's tall men. <laughs> <laughs> So what happens is these tall men usually bang their heads on the roof and the hard hat falls off and then they and they laugh at it and they pick it up and then they bang their head on the roof and the hard hat is in their hand and not on their head. So you'll remember to put your hard hat in your head, please. Okay. Okay, this gentleman is laughing. Now, we all come through that small tunnel there. It would have been a very difficult job to drill 20 holes in the tunnel that side. But when these miners come to here, get to this area here, they're all very, very excited. I'm like you, like you're not very excited. Why aren't you excited? This is a, this, show me some enthusiasm here. This is, yeah. can't, you see the, can't you see the gold? You can't see the gold. This is the quartz reef that contains the gold. Oh. Right, you can see the gold is hidden in this white quartz stone here and this grey puggy sort of clay stuff around yeah. here. So that this reef here will go all the way up to the surface. It goes in in that 70 degree angle all the way to the surface and deep into the hill there behind you. At the surface, natural erosion will wash this puggy clay stuff away, release those tiny specks yeah. of gold, chunks of quartz reef will eventually break off, and the whole lot will roll all the way down the hill and end up on the creek. 
So that's how the gold got to the creek in the first place. It takes hundreds of thousands of years of erosion to put that lovely gold in the creek. So when these miners get here, they take out 200 tonnes of this quartz stone, take it to a crushing plant, they crush it to a fine powder, and then uh, when they get the results back, it's, uh, it's quite disappointing. <coughs> it's only half an ounce, half an ounce of gold per tonne of this reef. Oh. So a tonne of, ton of this quartz stone in a large steel bucket would be the size of a large washing machine or one of those oil carts you've seen around the, around the uh, blacksmith shop. A half an ounce of gold is about the size of a $2 coin. Mm. That's just not enough gold per tonne of this reef to be profitable. So they do the best they can to follow the reef right down to the south end, the end of the leased area, and all the way up to the north. You'll see the north drive when we go out to the main drive a bit later on. Um, but they work here for nearly six years until all their capital is spent. They do not improve their gold value. And what happens is now the shareholders have just lost all their money because there's no money left. They didn't find any gold. So they are, the mine's broke, so they have to sell this mine. So uh, sold and bought by the Long Tunnel Extended Gold Mine Company. So what they intend to do is uh, leave this reef here, continue the main drive another 100 metres into the hillside and put a huge vertical shaft down and it should intersect this reef here at a much, much deeper level. At the same, they want to, inter to intersect the reef at the same level as the other gold mines are on in Mahala. Because the other gold mines started their reef just above the creek level. We started the reef here uh, our tunnel here way far, halfway up the side of this hill. We're far too high on the reef. So they've got to get deeper down on the reef to get the better quality gold. They managed to raise 57,600 pounds of shareholders' money to start this mine in 1871. It's known as the, uh, the Long Tunnel Extended Gold Mine Company, it's what it's as it's now known today. So um, that's what they intend to do. Uh, that 50, 57,000 pounds is like $50 million on today's money. That's an incredible amount of money. So what, uh, that's what they intend to do. So right, any questions here before we move on? We're over 230 metres in from the entrance now, but it took the long tunnel extended gold mine company four years to dig their way down to here. Used the hammer and tap method at the start and worked all the way down here, very, very slow going. But around about 1875, they started using pneumatic tools, air driven tools, jackhammers like this thing here. So these things work really, really well. They work far better than the hammer and tap method. They work so well that the biggest problem they caused was dust. But that was a serious problem in those mines in those days. It was killing these miners at an alarming rate. They're just inhaling this dust into the ones at the end of the small tunnels. It's just very poor ventilation. So a young man starting on a jackhammer like this at the age of 18 was most likely dead by the time he was 28. That was a very, very, very short lifetime for a working man in those days. But uh, thankfully, as gold mining was going on all over the world, some of the American invented this drilling bit here. Similar to that drilling bit there, but this drilling bit here has a small hole so in this end here, which time. goes all the way through to the tip. So a small amount of water was injected through there when this was in operation. How does that cool that tip and make that tip, tip last longer? But the best thing it did do is it stopped that dust. It turned out dust from horrible great sludge that was splashed all over the miner. But it saved many, many miners' lives just by turning that dust into sludge. So these little things here known as a miner spider. So these little gauges are very important. You took your miner spider with you to work and you would bang it into a crevice in the rock like that. Then take out your wax candle. Stick your wax candle in this little hole here. So that's uh, these are actually little candle holes. It's very important that you took your little candle hole over here to work. And um, that, that candle was a great improvement on the lighting before before that, before this. Um, the previous lighting before the wax candle was the slush lamp, which was a shallow dish filled with animal fat. And uh, it was had a bit of cotton for a bit of fun uh, for a week. And it gave a very, very poor light. But as you can see, as the years progressed, they progressed from a, a, um, a slush lamp to wax candles to electricity, and now we've got LED lights. <laughs> <laughs> see how much things have improved. The LED light is just a marvelous event. So this, so this, this chamber we're standing in here is our boiler chamber. So this boiler, this chamber here was put boilers on the inside of mine. Those boilers look like this little diagram here. They were about, but they were about six meters long and about two meters diameter. And the very first boiler sat right here. Those boilers 
work is very similar to what a steam train does. They fill it up with water, they light a big wood fire at one end, and that heats that water till it turns to steam. That steam will run an air compressor. With that compressed air, they run all their jackhammers and tools and other machinery in the mine. Yeah. So they, uh, that boiler sitting here would burn somewhere between five and six tonnes of wood per day, each boiler. When this mine was in full operation, this mine had five boilers. One here, obviously, and four in the chamber next door. So they're now burning somewhere between 30 and 35 tonnes of wood a day, six days a week, as many days of the year to keep this mine operating. Towards the end of the mining period, there was not a usable tree standing around Walhalla for eight kilometres in any direction. They cut down all the trees around Walhalla to burn in these boilers. And as you can see, Walhalla's got lots of trees around there now. Um, nature has a very good way of healing man's scars on the planet. Would have been very, very hot in here, probably excess of maybe 40, maybe 45 degrees all the time. So they put this ventilation shaft in, and uh, that allows a cool breeze to come into the mine and um, it greatly adds to the oxygen levels. Right, so it's also a move to the exit. So this is, this is a modern day drilling bed. So this is an industrial diamond teeth on the end here. So these things uh, should be nice and pointy. If it was a this was a new piece, this would be worth more than twenty-five thousand dollars. Very expensive piece, but it's just set up on a machine, let the pipe screws in the end here, and that just grinds its way into the rock. It just keeps going more and more lengths of pipe on and until this thing it just keeps going in. So these things will go in for more than a kilometer into the rock. They take out a long, long thin sample of rock like this. That's only just a very, very small piece of that one kilometer length piece of rock. So here is a sample of what uh, that's been cut in half for us, so we can see that quartz through this sample here. Mm -hmm. Now the quartz is different to uh, to rock, and obviously it contains a lot of silica, which is like glass. And it allows the light to pass through there without uh, but not passing through the rock. Is that pretty cool? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you see any sparkly little bits of gold on there? You can. Mm -hmm. All right, he's pretty happy. <laughs> 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 Four holes in the wall there to be one large hole. <laughs> so obviously there was not enough gold in these samples to be worth digging large holes. So the long term extended gold mine company started here in 1871. It took them four years to dig that passageway, five years to dig this chamber here and uh, connecting passageways. The company before them was the Hercules United. They were here for six years. So if you had all those numbers up, this mine has been operating for 15 years. And nobody's made one cent profit. In fact, what they're doing is spending millions and millions of the shareholders' money trying to find good quality gold, and the shareholders are not very happy. Mm. I see not very happy either. If this was your business investment, your personal investment, your super fund or your company's investment, and you had not received any dividends for this very long period of time, you'd most likely sell your shares and put them in the mine next door. And the mine next door is making an absolute fortune, and this mine is really struggling. So I can just show you some fool's gold and tell you we've been digging here for 15 years and found nothing. So I can see why you're not happy. <laughs> All right, I'll take you next door and try and find something to cheer you up. <laughs> All right, first <laughs> Okay, come right in. This is our boiler chamber. So this chamber here was, was put here to put boilers in here. Originally this chamber was actually 43 metres long in this direction here. But obviously you can see that's all collapsed over there. We end up timbered it off and make it all safe for us. So this is the boiler section. Number two boiler was just behind that brick wall. Number three boilers where most of you are standing there. Number four and five boilers was here and here. Obviously, the smoke from those boilers must go somewhere. That's one of the main chimneys. That chimney goes 150 metres all the way up to the surface. Uh, it took three years to dig that chimney. And it's a very, very hard job to do. It's not even a metre diameter. If you wonder why all this water is dripping in here, that water is actually coming from the surface. 
When it rains on the surface, the soil absorbs that uh, water, it slowly works its way all the way through the rocks, and it takes about 10 days to get down to here. But when it all, but then you think it's been raining for three days, and then you've got to get slowly drip three days with the rain all the way through here. So it's virtually a continuous little thing. Two years ago, these boards here that we're standing on were dry as uh, bones because it was just dry as the desert sands. But nowadays, we have a lot of rain. But anyway, the, these miners start on that main shaft, that main shaft at the far end of this chamber here. So as the main shaft is going down, it should be getting closer and closer to intersecting the reef. On the 15th of July, 1881, actually relocate that reef. But only to find that the, the stone that they're bringing out, that lovely quartz stone, is a very, very poor quality. They have to tunnel on for another uh, six months to find good quality stone, and they're lucky they did find this good quality stone because they only had about three or four thousand pounds left in the kitty. Uh, had they not found a good stone, this mine wouldn't turn out to be the good mine it is today. But I'll just show you what, some idea what this mine looks like underground. So you can all see this. This is where we've entered the mine here. We've walked 250 odd metres to here. That black line down there is that uh, main shaft. That main shaft is the far end of this chamber here. It's in the collapsed area, so I can't show you that. But as they go down here, this is where they found the quartz stones, about 183 metres down. The quartz stone is indicated by the grey shaded area all through the map. So when they find that, they tunnel in and they put a final level there and they take all that quartz stone out of that level. Then they go down another level, another 30 metres down, start a new level, and they take out the quartz stone. Every 30 metres down, they take out quartz stone. This mine has got 32 levels. As you can see, the main shaft it gets deeper and deeper and deeper, and way down here to 937 metres down. Eight and a half kilometres of tunnelling here. So we're standing about right there. Can you imagine what's under your feet right now? It's just a massive network of tunnelling, and the water level is right up to the very top. But it took so long for this little bucket elevator, just two men at a time, to go up and down here. Uh, so they put this incline shaft in. On the incline shaft, they had a little carriage that had 12 men sit on that carriage, and they'd be quickly sped down in, in through here. It was great for shift changes, get men in and out of the mine quickly. And at the end of that incline shaft, right here, you see the lovely patch of quartz stone. They kept them going for some time, they, they enjoyed that. But you can see from here down, the roof is getting thinner and thinner and thinner. So they sunk another shaft down here to see how much of the roof was left. 1,120 metres is where they stopped. Now, as you can see, there's no quartz stone down there. They've actually gone past the reef. The reef has been exhausted. That little bit of quartz there was the last bit of quartz taken out of this mine in 1914. This mine closed in 1914. When this mine had closed, this mine had produced 440,312 ounces of gold. That's equivalent to 13.7 tonnes of gold. So we're not measuring gold in ounces anymore. We're now measuring in tonnes. But the mine next door was on good gold earlier than this mine, good 12 years earlier, and it produced 25.4 tonnes of gold. All these mines in Mohawa were up, produced about 55 tonnes of gold. On today's market, that's more than $3 billion. Now you know why Mohawa is such an important little gold mining town. This is the richest single reef in Victoria, this is known as Cohen's Reef. Now, in the, in the heyday when Mullahalla had a population of about 3,500 people living in town, the population at the moment has increased over the last 20 odd years. We now have 18 permanent people in town. <laughs> <laughs> now, just a couple of interesting points. The Emperor Shaft is down opposite the Wally Pub. It went down to 427 metres. They got 4.5 tonnes of gold out of the little mine, which um, did very well. The console shaft, it's in the Northern Gardens, uh, up in the gully up there. It went out of 579 metres. They tunnelled around here for 23 years. You can see what they got, it's written right there. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. 23 years, blood, sweat and tears and lies were lost in their mind and they got nothing. So if you invest your money in there, you, you, you've lost big time. But that's what gold mining is like. It's about you know you can you don't know where that gold is. And you get that gold feed and you just keep on digging until all your money is gone. 
You could, could make a fortune in a week if you're a little prospector or something and like find a rich patch. Mm -hmm. And you could be like a big company like this and spend millions and millions of dollars on there and find nothing. Mm -hmm. Anybody invest in gold mines today? Mm -hmm. I certainly do not. <laughs> so this is a replica of what that main shaft would have looked like. It was about three metres wide and two metres deep. Uh, that, that's our mind of Fred there. He's in there looking after that end. But this is your business end. This is your this is your part that will be hauled up from your 900 metres on that sheave and pulley system through here. But this is only a replica. It's not in the right place. This was here. It was actually in the back of that main chamber. And when, when this cart was winched all the way up here, it was hauled out of here, and it probably once you get about 15 carts here, they're all taken down to the crushing plant to get that lovely quartz stone crushed and get that gold extracted. When no empty cart was going down, two men would stand in this cage here, and they'd be lowered there 900 metres down to their working area. When you go down to your working area, it's not unusual for you to be standing knee deep in freezing cold water for the eight hour duration of your shift. You don't fancy that, do you? Uh, no, these miners had to work in those conditions. But they, their boots would rot and fall off their feet in those wet conditions. So they leave the boots in the brew room and tie fatty rags around their feet to protect their feet from the cold water and the sharp rocks. Can you imagine what the feet would have looked like after six night shifts or something, yeah? They'd be pretty, pretty wet and soggy by Sunday. Yeah. But uh, these miners did get paid a lot more than the average farmer or factory worker would have got in those days. They worked under very difficult, very extreme conditions. There was lots of accidents in these mines and a lot of men died in these mines. Um, the average lifespan of a working man in those days was 46. Today it's about 83. And you have to remember, in those days, they all had large families. They all often were 12 or maybe more children. Um, and the, um, there was no welfare. The government gave you nothing. There was no family allowance. There was no Medicare. Well, no handouts from the government at all. All they did was put their hand out and take your tax. So you had to look after your family, and the working man had a very big responsibility of looking after his family. If he was killed or injured, that family was in serious problems. The tour was very informative, and I highly recommend it, although I was glad to be back out in the open air. We stop by Stringers Park to have a light lunch. There is a general store near the post office where you can buy some light food. There are sit-down meals available at the Grey Horse Cafe and the Wahala Lodge Hotel, but they don't really have capacity to handle large crowds during public holidays. So I do recommend packing some food along if you are visiting during the major holidays. The park is very beautiful during autumn, and you can see the old post office the old fire station and the old gold vault nearby. You can also take a nice hike along the tramline walkway from here to the mine and the north gardens. Next stop by the Wahala Cemetery, which is near the railway. The Wahala Cemetery is the final resting place for approximately 1,300 people. Walking around and reading the headstones, you will see that many of the residents and children died young, either due to miners complaint, the lung disease afflicting miners, or various diseases that are treatable today. We next took a ride on the Wahala Goldfield Railway. Tickets cost about $30 for a return trip, and the train will take you down to the Thompson River Station before returning. You can book online or purchase the tickets on-site at the store. The original railway closed in 1944, but in 1993, a group of enthusiasts rebuilt the section of the line from the Thompson River up to the town. The train started operating in 2002 as a tourist attraction.
the round trip to Thompson River and back takes about one hour. We had to alight the train at Thompson River as they needed to switch the train around for the return journey. While they were doing that, you can visit the railway bridge and take some photos there. The train was ready for boarding about 10 minutes later. On our return, we were lucky to catch the golden sunset hour. And I hope you enjoyed this video. I would also like to take a moment to talk about Topaz Labs Video Enhanced AI. It is a software that leverages AI and machine learning to enhance your videos. I have used it on my videos where the lighting was not optimal, and I was amazed by how it is able to remove grain from low light footage and sharpen the images. It is also able to upscale your videos to a higher resolution, which is great as I have a lot of old travel videos which I shot in standard definition which I can now upscale to 4K. Besides Video Enhance, they also have a suite of other tools for photo enhancement as well. I highly recommend this software, and if you are interested, please use my link in the description below as it helps support this channel. That's all from me, and thanks for watching this video.